Hello and welcome to Ticket Manager's All Access Interview Series, engaging leaders from across the sports marketing spectrum to identify and explore critical issues in the business of sports, entertainment, sponsorship, activation, ticketing, hospitality, and even more. I'm your host, Jim Andrews. Joining me on this episode is Matt Yonan, president of Tigris Marketing, a boutique agency specializing in sponsorship and in particular strategy, negotiation, activation, and measurement which you all know are some of my favorite subjects. Matt, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Great to see you again. Thanks, Jim. Love being here. Thanks for the invite. Looking yeah. forward to the conversation. As am I. One of the, the, the many reasons that we have for, for inviting you to join the podcast is the fact that you know, Tigris, which you founded now about 20 years ago, hard to believe, I'm sure it's even harder for you to believe, is you're thriving as an independent boutique firm, you know, working with brands involved in, in sponsorships and partnerships. And, you know, conventional wisdom, as long as I've been doing this, which is a long time, says that's a pretty difficult space to occupy, competing with larger agencies and, and, and you know, for other reasons, too. So my first question is, is probably the, the big one, which is how have you managed to, to succeed in, in what can be a very challenging space? It's a many faceted issue about how to deal with being a smaller agency in this space. Because candidly, Jim, we're competing against agencies that are, you know, 10, 20, 50 times our size, literally. So, you know, it's very common for us to be in pitches against agencies that are a lot larger, have much larger resources. And yet, which I know you know this, but, you know, our client roster is pretty incredible. And I say that like if there's days where we all you know, joke around the office, like, can you believe we have the clients that we have? Like a lot of household names, brand names that, you know, much larger agencies you would think would be servicing yet it's Tigris. And so we've, we've made it, you know, a really good name for ourselves in the industry, but candidly, it's not easy. I mean, we've had some overtures in the past to be bought. I think we've decided, or I have decided rather, and I think my staff is on board with this, that we'd much rather be independent, small, have sort of an attitude of like, hey, we can do this. We don't we don't need, you know, like the big coffers or the big pockets uh, to make this happen. And I think that's that's a commitment to working harder, candidly. That's that's just a commitment to having to work harder than the other guy, still doing great work. I would say our success is born out of our commitment to have extremely good relationships with our clients and to do really, really good work. I mean, you can't, we, we say it all the time in the office, you can't have one or the other. It has to be both. And candidly, I, I would say it's almost equally both because I can have a really great relationship with my client. We love each other. We get along. We, we do trips together, all this kind of stuff. But if our work it sucks, you know, they're just going to be like, hey, I mean, we like these guys, but these guys That's are flashy. Great. And this other agency has been calling on me forever. And, you know, Brands still take coffees and still take lunches with other folks. So we know that we've always got to pay attention to that. And at the same time, we can't just be about the work because I've been in the business long enough and you have too, where there's a lot of mean people out there. Candidly, I've seen a lot of agency people. I've been in meetings where agencies are yelling at clients or properties. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is like a time bomb, uh, but it really does happen. And so, you know, the work has to be really good also. So it's got to be great work, great relationships, those two together. And I feel like that's our focus 100% of the time is how do we get both of these, these done really well so that we can propel the business? And, you know, it's a lot of hard work when you're, we don't have a, a business development team. That's me. That's my staff. We're looking for, I know we're going to talk about this probably some more when we get there, but organic opportunities for our agency, but it's hard in this world of big agencies and you know, I have friends at the big agencies like at Washerman and Octagon and CAA, and I applaud them for what they're doing. And at the same time, I, when we're in these conversations, they're like, I wish we were that small. Like, <laughs> I wish we could go back to that time when there was like 20 of us kind of together rowing in the same direction because it's so big now. It's so hard to get stuff done. So I just, I don't know. That's sort of where we are as a boutique agency. And I'm really proud of the work and the client roster we have and, and what we're doing, but it is, we're gutting it out. 
Well, I, I can I can imagine that. And you know, without casting aspersions on anyone that I used to work for, but sure. uh, having gone through that experience, I recall those those wistful <laughs> conversations about you. Remember when it was it was just us, and there weren't shareholders and and others that we needed to be concerned about. Uh, you know, public shareholders and, and things like that. But yeah, I mean it. Being big adds a whole lot of complications uh, and can make it just sometimes not not so fun. <laughs> but uh... yeah, and, and I think I think the other interesting part. So one one side of this equation for me is w just winning business, just you know getting clients. We can talk more about that later. But the other part of it is actually retaining talent. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. And I I think you know when I look around the industry, and we're constantly interviewing people because you know since COVID, it's the, the amount of time that a person will stay at a job, I feel like has decreased significantly. So here we are in this place where you look at resumes now and it's two to three years is kind of the average. Right. So we're working really hard to keep people, but candidly, the reality is that a bigger agency sounds, you know, grass is greener. It sounds sexier to be like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm going to go do this this thing at this big agency who's got the Olympics or World Cup or dealing with brand clients that are investing, you know, like the tier one sponsors, like the State Farms, great. They're going to go work on that activation program. So it's very different. So that's the other part of this that's a challenge for a smaller agency is just retaining people because as we grow people up, they get more talented and they're like, great, now I can go find the next spot for me. And as a 15 to 20 person agency, that becomes tricky because there's a little bit of a ceiling with, you know, unless somebody quits, there's not an opportunity. So that's that's something we're looking to try and help our our folks like develop is like, how do we develop them? How do we grow them? How do we give them new opportunities and and solve that part of what we've tried to do is grow through an acquisition. And I will tell you, that is really tough. I've tried twice now. And when, when you're dealing with smaller agencies that we've tried to acquire, there's a, a very clear thought about what that business might be worth. And when you have others that are helping you, you know, negotiate and do all these things, you just, there's just a, a limit to, I think, what a, a founder's willing to sell for, like a base value rather. So that's been pretty tricky for us to try and find another way to grow like that. But we're on the path again to look for something. So we're kind of 0 and 2 in that space. Uh, <laughs> I would say I would say 1 and 2. We did one successfully and we, now we've tried two others and it hasn't worked. So, uh, but yeah, that and that's an important piece for um, not only client growth, but I think just personal development for our people too. So. Hey Matt, what about does geography play into that too? I mean, you're you're in in, in Colorado, you know, a beautiful part of our part of the country. Yeah. But you know, it you know, I would imagine that it's at some point there there are folks that are, you know want to be in in, in maybe a, a bigger city on on one of the coasts, whatever it might be. Yeah. And obviously, we all you know, geography is less important now than it ever was. Now that we're all you know working with uh, modern technology and can and can be remote. But does that still does that play a factor in it for for Tigris as well? It, it does. It totally does. I think I, I spend a fortune on United. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's part of our deal is, you know, I will get on a plane and most of our people will too. If I need to go have a cup of coffee with a client or a potential client, that's what we do to erase geographical barriers. And, but, but from an, from a talent acquisition, Denver's great because people think Denver's amazing. So that's right. actually really helpful but it does create an issue on the new business front where we're, I mean, I can literally get almost anywhere in the country and candidly in the world within certainly one flight, if not only two. So that's really helpful for us, but it is a barrier that I can't walk down the street. You know, I can't walk down Park Avenue and go have a meeting. I've got to get on a plane and that's a commitment when I'm already traveling a lot. So that, that is an issue, but not on the talent side, at least. One of the things that you mentioned to me when we talked a few weeks ago, and I thought was really interesting, you said that some of your business comes from saying yes to some projects that the larger agencies actually turn down. And so that I, I'm curious as to how you discover those opportunities, you know, and, and you know, as you alluded to, just in general, how does the kind of just dev work for you? You, you don't have a, a you know dedicated sales force there. It, it's you yeah. and some folks so are, are 
are brands finding you or you know how you know, what's kind of the mix of, of all that my training up in the business you know no when when you and i started in this world none nobody had a degree in sports marketing right it was right. like you kind of fell into it or you knew a person who helped you a friend of a friend kind of thing so i got into this business through where I, I went to university of illinois and through our athletic director there i i met my first boss who was dean bonham in the bonham group and that's which isn't around anymore and i after 10 years ended as uh, the VP of sales marketing. So I was kind of like the business development person. So I was, and I did it all. I did the client services stuff, business development. I kind of liked it all. And that's when I decided I was going to start Tigris. And I tell you that because I think in a lot of ways, like I know the business really well. I know how to do the work. I also know how to sell it. And I really like people and being around people. So I can easily engage in conversations and how can I help you solve, you know, some of the issues or challenges that you're having in your business around this topic of sponsorship. And so I just candidly, Jim, work really hard at getting to meet people when I'm at events, when I'm traveling, I will, I'll do all the things. I will call a client and say, I know, you know, so-and-so warm leads, cold leads, meeting people at events. It's amazing where we get leads and a lot of our clients come from other clients candidly so we th this is part of the why we're nice to people and we do good <laughs> work because number one they go somewhere else eventually almost nobody stays at the same job for more than like five years maybe 10 and in, in the on the brand side so we know they're going to go somewhere else and that's important for us to stay in contact with them and also we just i mean we know that they'll introduce us to other people if we do a good job so that's sort of our deal is making sure that we're in front of clients a lot, that we're top of mind. We're really good at simple things like you have not been, but you will be, Jim, moving forward. You'll be on our, our holiday list. And we, I think um, our team does one of the best jobs with holiday gifts. We tell the story. We tell why we're giving this gift, why it's meaningful to our company, and uh, personally what is meant for me and why we're actually giving them this thing. And every year... I. Uh, probably 20 or 30, we, we have 250 people on our gift list, 20 or 30 will send a photo of all the things that were in the gift and the cards and the stories and all those things. And they're like, I've never seen anything like this. And I think I want every touch from Tigris to a client or a prospect or a friend of our business to be super intentional, really thoughtful. And I, I candidly, I want our competitors to be frustrated by that because they're like, we can't pull that off. Right. We just have, it's too big or we're, we, we don't have the budget or da, da, da. And here we are spending a fortune on that touch with clients because we know that they know it's special. We know we're paying attention to them differently than others. And I want them to feel like we care about them because we do. They're important to us personally and our business. So it's things like that, that I think make our agency different in terms of how we develop our relationships and prospect and all that. But honestly, it just comes down to hard work. And, you know, somebody, somebody said to me recently, like, wow, you guys get pretty lucky. And I said, well, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I feel like that's true. Like we've got a lot of folks that work really hard on our accounts and that leads to really good opportunities for us. So. Well, and it speaks to you know, taking advantage of the, the good points of being about being smaller and the things yeah. that you can do exactly. that a bigger agency can't, even if that applies to something like like holiday gifts, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mentioned in in the intro some of the the services, the, the specific services that Tigris offers, and and one of those is something that you and I have a shared interest in, and that's uh, sponsorship measurement. So I'd love to hear just kind of your, your philosophy, your your approach to to evaluating sponsorship performance. I think one of the things that makes us really unique is that we are an agency that's really good at the strategy, the negotiations, activation. I mean, I'm just super proud of our team and all the work we do in those areas. And it's really good. And we've got clients on a roster like, you know, the Chick-fil-A's and Western Unions and Excel Energy and Philips. I mean, we're doing strategy work and activation work for those clients and have in the past. And I think that's it. We have some really solid clients that we help on that. Yet, I think what makes us so good at that is we're really good at measurement. And I think that's really unique in our industry. Rarely do I see an agency 
that is good at the first parts and then also has a strength of measurement. Or it's the flip where you've got maybe some of our competitors that are strong in measurement, but when they're measuring and in providing theoretical follow-ups or recommendations for clients, they're not actually doing all this other work. So it's like, how do you apply this measurement if you don't aren't in this other part of the business? So that's what I feel like makes, first of all, our measurement offering so strong is it's based in reality. I mean, we're negotiating and activating and providing strategy for clients every single day. So when we're valuing a sponsorship or we're doing research around it or providing a model, which I'll talk to you about in a second, like that's all rooted in all this experience that we've got with all these different industries separate from measurement. So I think that's really helpful for a client to know like, well, what do other people do and what kind of strategies are they putting in place to impact the results? And we can answer that. So, cause we're so, we're so involved. I think from our our perspective, I think measurement still today is very linear. And by that, I mean, it's maybe I'm using the wrong word. That's the word I, I like to use. And the reason why I say that is because it's very much, we'll measure this piece of it, it's valuation, great. Or we'll measure brand awareness or loyalty, great. But the problem is, is how do all those things come together? I, I tell clients all the time, Okay, if you've got a CEO who's, or, or you've got your C-level execs all in a room and you're asking them as this sponsorship marketing person on the team, tell me what success means with sponsorship. I guarantee they're each going to give you a different answer. Absolutely. Yeah. They're going to give you a different answer. And so how can you make everybody at the table happy if you're only measuring one particular thing? So that's how we approach this. We measure as much as we can get our hands on. And then we create a model for clients that actually combines all of those things into a system where now if I've got six or seven or eight components that are impacting what my scoring looks like or what success actually is for this partnership, I can tell you what's going wrong with that deal. I can literally point to something and say, this is what we have to change next year for us to be successful, which I would say 90% of the industry will go, mm, I'm not exactly sure. I have a feeling of what might be wrong. That promotion didn't go really well. The team didn't really deliver on that thing. They really did well on this thing, but this part we're suffering. And so, but we can actually bring the data from a lot of different perspectives in and say, this is what we do to improve the partnership moving forward. And candidly, if if you can't, you can't. But our, our job, and we're in the business, we believe sponsorship is a worthwhile exercise. So um, our job is to improve it, we feel like, and make sure it's on strategy. And I feel like that's really the difference maker. And that's why we're pretty sticky with a lot of our clients that we're working with on the on the measurement front specifically. Yeah. And so that, I'm really interested in, in, in that. And in particular, you know, having tried to convince brands, persuade brands that that's the right way to think about measurement in, in, in a past life and remembering kind of running up against the answer always was yes, understand, get it. And then when it came to actually putting their money where their mouth was and, and doing it, 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 you know, that was, that was the big challenge. It's it, not it, cheap. Yeah. Get, go holistic, it, right? It's, a, it's an expensive exercise to measure you know, business analytics metrics to do research, to pull in other broadcast data, social data, all the other impressions data. I mean, there's a lot that goes into, you know, a full analytics model and it's a lot of work and it it's expensive, but we've got clients that are, now this is the difference maker. Having a client that's saying, I care and I want to improve versus a client that's like, well, nobody asked me. So why would I do that? <laughs> and I always think that's a that's dangerous great. answer because wait five minutes and your <laughs> CEO or somebody or a new CEO is going to say, uh, yeah, so why do we do that deal? What are we getting out of that deal? I literally have a client right now that has hired us to start working on analytics. We've been working for them for a number of years. It's a financial institution. And he just started hiring us to do the analytics piece of it now because he's he's pretty sure his CEO is going to retire in a couple of years. <laughs> He's already building the case and uh, why this works for the brand where right, right now the CEO loves it more than anybody. 
So it's like it's very it's a very safe topic. But you know, when leadership changes, questions get asked and nothing is safe. <laughs> yeah, nothing is safe. Exactly. In general, Matt, do you find that there are more clients that are kind of willing to look at that big picture and, and maybe not kind of take the attitude of like, I'm not going to bother, I'm not going to answer the question until somebody asks? Is it is it getting a little I, better? Of our current clients, I feel like there's more that are willing to, to do that. But I mean, I'm in a couple of discussions right now where they're like, wow, that's cool. But I don't know if I want to commit that much money to doing that. It's like, okay, I get it. I get it. But you know, on that deal that you're spending $30 million on, that's don't you think it's worth like this much money? What's to do the percentage? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the part that kills me. And it goes back to one of the number one things, other than that top swath of sponsors, every year, and you know this, right? You could, this has got to be a soapbox for you. I know it is. Activation. <laughs> I mean, it gets cut. It's the first thing to go. It's like, great. We have this Lamborghini in the garage, but we don't have any gas to actually drive it. And that is baffling to me. And then, by the way, we decided not to put it in the shop, even though it's not working right. That that makes no sense in the rest of the world. But for some reason in sponsorship, it does. So they don't activate against it and they don't measure it. And we kind of scratch our heads and go, that doesn't make any sense to me. But that is sort of the world we live in. It's one of the first things to get cut is activation and then measurement also. So. You, you mentioned the, the, there is an exp obviously a, a, you know, an expense behind doing all of that. Is it getting better in terms of, you know, with all, all of the technology that we have before? Is it, is it overall helping to bring some of those costs down or is that not my... Uh, I don't feel like it is. Okay. I feel like it's another expense. I mean, we've got, it, it's all over the board. And part of, the, part of the problem is we've got partners that we use you know, they're doing broadcast and social and all this stuff because we don't own that technology. We're we're hiring them as a vendor for work we're doing. And it's really interesting because we'll get pricing all over the board and we hear things. We're like, hey, I just got I mean, I'll literally call the vendor. I just got a call from so-and-so and you're selling them what we're buying for like half the cost. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is there's really no standard. Everybody's cutting deals, trying to grow. They're trying to make their businesses work but it is still an expensive exercise to track broadcasts against, you know, a season's worth of PGA or a season's worth of F1 or whatever it might be. And we're doing all that kind of work for our clients. And it's still not like, oh, that's no brainer. We should do it. What has gotten cheap is like earned media. That's pretty inexpensive to do, but I think broadcast and social, you know, the problem is the technology has gotten so big about, oh, I can literally dial into this portal and I can see this earned media and I uh, or, or social and I go in and I can click it and then I can actually play the story or play the post. Or, so there's so much technology behind it that costs a lot of money that I think that's, it's, it's still generating a lot of money for companies. So I think that's the thing. It's not like super cheap. I wish it was, but it's really not. You mentioned, you know, working with, with, with various partners and, and one of those, really unique partnership that, that you have is with the uh, the Center for Sports Analytics at Samford uh, University. I've, I've been a big believer for a while that we're missing a lot of opportunity to kind of tap into the resources that university programs such as Samford's and, and there's a lot of other uh, really good ones out there can provide. So I, I, I'd love to hear more about you know, how that alliance works and how that all came about. We sat as a staff, this is about five or six years ago, and we do this every year. Our, our whole staff gets together. We do year-end planning, and we're we talk through what's going to be our next year. What what are we going to focus on as an organization? How are we going to get better? And uh, one of our team members brought up, you know, around our analytics. We all already felt really good. We are. I already tell people I think we're the best in the business in terms of our analytics and measurement skills. Yet, how can we get better? And so. You know, we sort of brainstormed and thought we should partner with the university. And so a gal on our team, she did some research. She laid some phone numbers, letters. She sent me some phone numbers. Okay, these are people you should need to call at some point. Literally, I was like on my way to vacation, trying to get rid of all my emails so I could like have a free mind for, you know, a week. And I called Dr. Darren White at Sanford in Birmingham. And he and I had this conversation and man, did we hit it off just the connection on, 
what's important to him and what his team is doing there and what we were working on. And I said, you need to come to Denver. And then I was in Birmingham and all this, this, these juices started flowing. And the reason why we're, we do work with them. We don't do all of our measurement work with them, but we do do a bunch with them. We're doing thought leadership. We did a really great study on women's sports during COVID that SBJ published an article on. We do, uh, so thought leadership stuff, we do paid work. We do student-led work together. We support their students in doing work when they're doing a project for like English soccer team or a pro team here in the U.S. We're actually behind the scenes helping pull that off for their students. And we that's all gratis. We do it free of charge. Because what we're trying to do is bring up the next generation of analytics people. I mean, it's an area that I think is very specific and Samford's unique in that it not only does it do like the money ball side of it, like player and that kind of data, they're also focused on the business of sports and analytics and measurement. And they're one of the only programs that has like an entire program focused on that. So for grad uh, undergrads and graduates. And so we love that we're hiring their interns. We just hired one of their students as a full-time employee. She's amazing. And I would just say from our perspective, not only does it make it better, us better is an agency. I, one example, we had a, a company who had a patch partnership with an NBA team, very sophisticated. They have lots of business analytics folks on their team. And they just said like, we need help understanding, is this actually doing anything for our brand and for our company period? Like, okay, this is a pretty complicated issue. So we did this huge research study collected all this BI data. We literally, Jim, we did phone calls with probably six or seven of their BI folks. And we did it with our team, Dr. White. And then he hired, as a part of this, two other PhDs to help us. So we had like this huge team working on this project. I'm so proud of the work. This client went out and did another patch deal. They were really happy with the work. And I think from our perspective, that's what that partnership is about. We were, we're trying to raise the level of thinking, trying to insert new ideas, help our clients see new things that they can learn through research and analytics that they've not seen before from us or from anybody in the industry. I think we're doing a really great job of that. Dr. White's amazing. We're literally, we work together with his team. Well, him, he works with our team literally every day. I'm sure you can't share the details, but I'm guessing since that company did a second deal that the results of your your study was that it was the patch was actually performing pretty well for them. Yeah, it was. And I think that was the trick is proving that because not everybody believed in it internally. So it was kind of like, this is what the data is telling us. We all agreed on how we would measure this. <clears throat> and here's what it's telling us. And people were like, wow, OK, that that's really interesting. But it's I mean, that there was math involved. I don't even know what they were talking about. I was on calls and uh, like offering nothing, which is unusual <laughs> for me. I like to talk. <laughs> yeah, when when, the, when the, the statisticians and then and uh, exactly. PhD start talking, it's time to Just show. get out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, well, Matt, before I let you go, I just you know love to ask you just kind of a, a general question because I mean you you mentioned some of the clients you're working with, some of those projects. You're working across a, a really wide range of of not only brands but 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 property partners. So you've got a really you know interesting and unique perspective on on, on the big picture. So you know I just like to throw out to you, uh, get your your take on what's the what's do you think is the state of sponsorship today? Kind of what's what's working well? Where is there room for improvement? It's so interesting because there's so many purists out there that are pushing back on inventory that it's like, that's not for sale. And yet there's others that are pushing forward. And I think one of the areas that I, I personally struggle with is everything's for sale. And in some ways, I agree with that. Because I'm in the business and that's what drives the business. We have to find new opportunities uh, to grow the business. And it and it's good for us. Patch deals results in measurement work or pa a patch deal results in a negotiation or evaluation or managing that. So that that's fine. But I think we're getting to a point where, you know, it's, and I know NASCAR and not bad mouthy NASCAR, but it was sort of the poster child for so many years of like, Ooh, that looks like NASCAR. You right. know, I mean, people would say that all the time. And yeah. honestly, there's almost no corner of the industry that doesn't look like NASCAR now. I mean, go to an NBA game. 
right? I mean, it's just signage is everywhere. And so I think knowing that today, I think the the industry is super healthy. I think it's sports is the place to be candidly, right? In, in terms of entertainment and TV and broadcast uh, fan events, all that. If you're in music, which we do some concert and, and music stuff, your music or sports, like these are the places to be in the marketing world right now because it's growing so, so uh, quickly still and always has been. So I think that part is healthy, but I think the part we all have to figure out is a, is a industry is like, where are we comfortable pushing and not pushing? What's sacred? What's not sacred? I mean, the NFL is holding out on their uniforms, but they're selling every other uniform, practice and community and all this other stuff, just not game jerseys. So like they're the only ones, but that, that statue is going to, you know, that's going to fall at some point. So I just, so in a, anyway, it's an interesting twist to kind of what we see in the growth areas in the industry. And I think from a, like where things could be improved, like, from a state of that or thinking that way, it's my a little bit of a soapbox. I really want properties to do a better job in reporting out on what clients get. I think, you know, the, like the Digitech project pro products are great because it's streamlining presentations, recaps, but I'll just be honest. Everybody hates recaps. <laughs> Nobody likes them. People like the discussion that happens in the room but they don't like going through a 40 page deck going, yep, that's the sign you got. Yep. That's the thing. Now, now there's executives that are disconnected and they want to see the signage and all that, like, they, cause they don't go to games or they're in a different geography. I get that, but we're in tons of recaps and candidly, Jim, everybody's like, like, come on, let's keep moving. Let's get to the, yeah. let's get to the actual discussion the where we talk about how did it actually do and how do we do better together next year? Like how do we build a stronger partnership? And I think, that's the part that's lacking is how do we partner better together? That's my that's my encouragement to properties to focus on that rather than spend a lot of time showing slides about the pictures that we've all, you know, we've been to the stadium, we see it, we get it. So right, right. It's almost like those, those recaps need to be flipped, right? Every, you, you know, that's all the kind of the either the background stuff that you yep. you want in there at some point if somebody needs to look at it. Yep. That yeah, don't don't lead with that. Let's start with you know the 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 real bottom line and and we, how can we use this as a springboard to doing better next year? And teams are trying. They're trying. They've got their analytics folks, their in-house intelligence folks. But you know, candidly, I think they're now immediately overwhelmed with what how you know they went from focused on all the doing all this research to now they're farming out a lot of research. Some of what we've been asked to do by a couple teams now because it's gone from fan, you know, fan research and sponsorship research to now they're measuring like, how long is the concessions line? How do we shorten that thing? Well, like what's, what's going on with parking or how come we didn't get the redemption rate on this promotion or something like that with, so I think they're swamped in their life and their work that, so now it's, how do we shift some of that back to sponsorship? Cause it's a big engine, you know, it's not, I mean, those chief revenue officers, they need support for what, you know, their clients are buying. And I think we need to see a little more of it. Candidly. Well, and I'll get on my soapbox too, and just say, I think some of that I, I would put back on the brands too. It's like, okay, if, if that's what you want, then you also need to be a little bit more transparent about what's important to you. Cause oh, I, can, push. Pretty, I can't push. give you that information um, without receiving what your, what your goals and objectives are. In, first. And push. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten at a meeting and my client will say, well, that wasn't really helpful. And I'm thinking, how come you didn't say that? Right. If you didn't like it, you should say it because that's what gets it done when the client, the one who's signing the check says, this isn't helpful to me. I need more. So then, you know, it becomes us having to do that, which is fine. It's just, yeah. it's different when the payor is the one that's like actually saying and pushing and finds the things that are really important to them and will push hard. You know, the Anheuser-Busch thing, I think was funny what was it three years ago, right? Nick Kelly comes out and he's like five years now, being almost six. Okay, okay, six <laughs> years, great. So he says we're per putting performance metrics in our deal, or that's what we're doing all these deals. And I've been doing it with a client for four or five years, and I was under an NDA not to use it with other clients. That's how like, and then you find out everybody's doing it, and now <laughs> we still get pushback on that where teams are like, well, we're not sure that we're willing to do that. And I'm thinking. Okay, 
So we have to pay an escalator. You're not really providing any data at the end of the year that's even usable. And yet, no matter what happens, we're still going to pay you more every year. I don't know. That seems like that's counterintuitive to the way the rest of everything works. Absolutely. So it takes, a. I guess my point is, it takes a special client to say no and be willing to say no and stand for that. Because that's what gets change done, like Nick did at AB. This is the way we're going to do our deal. If you want our money, you're going to say yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I respect that. Hey, and just that willingness even just to be a little bit more transparent about, hey, this is what we want. <laughs> so yeah. That as a first step, I think that's... Uh, exactly. Brands need to go there. So exactly. well, I, you, you and I could you know probably talk about this for the next few hours, but we both have other things we need to do and, and our listeners do too. So uh, let me just say, uh, Matt, thanks so much. This has been a great conversation. Really fun. Really enjoyed it. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to, uh, to do it again sometime. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Great talking with you. All right. And on behalf of Ticket Manager, I want to thank all of you for watching and listening and to remind you to please join us again for the next episode in the All Access interview series.